Coming up on The Local Show, the next Silicon Valley building fast and furious in downtown Kansas City. A special story about love and the search for family. And art beyond words. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. And I'm Nick Haynes. Welcome to The Local Show. There's a lot of attention being paid right now, both locally and nationally, to building our economy through technology. Startup America, for example. Of course, with the arrival of Google Fiber, it's been a particularly hot topic in Kansas City lately. While tech companies have been popping up all across the metro, there's a noticeable cluster developing in the vicinity of downtown and the crossroads. We take you inside three tech startups to show you more of what the scene looks like these days. Today, the six-story structure just south of the downtown loop is standing empty. But within the year, it will become home to a rising young company with big aspirations, whose product is regularly evaluated just a few miles away. Anytime that 19,000 fans gather to watch Kansas City's hottest sports franchise in action is also a time that Asim Pasha anticipates greatly. This is the night I've been looking forward to because this is about the energy, the excitement, the experience that we're going to put together today. I'm absolutely ready. But it's more than just the game on the field that Asim and his son are watching. As Sporting KC's tech guru, he's in charge of all the digital extras that make this one of the world's most innovative sports venues. I have people sitting in the, in the control room back there. Because I like when I walk around, people hear Asim, this is not working, and they get at the core of it all is the wireless network they've installed out here. HD Wi-Fi. 200 routers around the park that ensure constant connectivity to deliver the kind of interactive fan experience they believe today's ticket buyers have come to expect. This technology everywhere approach has a name, Fan 360. And Sporting Innovations, the tech startup within the sports club, is selling it to clients worldwide. Fan360 is an integrated software platform covering ticket sales to targeted ads, concession specials to video on demand. All this interactivity tracked and monitored on site in what they called the command center, then analyzed and refined before the next game rolls around. High-tech innovators taking an idea and making something from it is nothing new for the Metro. Fortune 500 companies like Sprint, Garmin, and Cerner all started here and stayed. In fact, two of Sporting's owners, Cliff Illig and Neil Patterson, came from the IT realm. Obviously, their backgrounds in, in creating Cerner and, and being very disruptive in the healthcare IT space was something that they challenged us around the sports side and said, you know, we've got this really great living lab. We've got this opportunity that's different than really any other sports team out there. Um, so let, let's go after it. This is a map of the venue, so you can like pinch and zoom, right? You may not care about ATMs, but you might care where a bathroom is. You might care where a handicap access is. You might care where a certain restaurant is or where you can buy beer. Hi, what can I get you? To really deliver an experience on mobile that you want, we have to know a lot about you and learn a lot about you. And that data is, is key for us to, to be able to do that. A different fan or a different day or a different Like game. the average age of sporting season ticket holders, 29, the workforce here skews young. They know what their peers want, and they're tech savvy enough to spot cutting edge ways to deliver it best. You know, like if we have the final three days of prod testing, we want that information in prod. They're the people who understand how to do it, and they understand the generation better than anybody else does. I think it's the right way to go after it. Do you look at other sporting franchises and think, guys are dinosaurs? 
Yes, but I don't want to mention that. Because there's some very uh, established industry players who look at the industry a certain way, and the change is not in their mantra yet, but believe it or not, they're changing too. Baby boomers are moving out, the new generation that's, that's being raised, they don't understand the world of paper and pencil. This industry is ripe for innovation at its roots. In less than two years, Fan360 is playing in 15 venues from Germany to Brazil. And sporting's expanding here at home as well, investing $20 million on the edge of the crossroads to renovate the old Hanna Rubber Building, where, as it turns out, soccer balls were once manufactured. We wanted a place that we thought could be attractive to the sort of demographic that we're looking for within our company. You know, just spending some time down here in the crossroads as we have over the course of the last year and a half, it's been really energizing for our people. And for me, it, it kind of reminds me of the days of being back in San Francisco and Chicago and places like that. So I like it personally, but I also know that our associate population is, is really fond of this environment, so we wanted to do everything we could to foster that. Growing up on the internet, you think about the world very differently. Everyone's connected. Adam Arredondo, one of the team members at KC Startup Village, is part of that next generation of entrepreneurs. Nimble, collaborative, not afraid to fail. It's no coincidence that many find a fit within the city's creative core and the co-working spaces that have begun to pop up. With the Office Port, with um, Think Big, which is just two blocks over, the heartbeat started. Now it's kind of spreading. Kansas City is blessed with a downtown ringed by affordable spaces where a number of high-tech neighborhoods have emerged. West Bottoms, River Market, and across state line. Not only innovating, but interacting. Through programs like the Kauffman Foundation's One Million Cups. What's the plan to bridge the gap? Bill Gates has a program. Where these weekly Wednesday meetups get people with ideas percolating together. In just eight months, attendance has risen from 12 to nearly 200. Eventually you get to the point where you're walking down the street and you see uh, other innovators, other startup guys. Come right. Those meetings, those unplanned meetings are kind of what lead to great ideas, what lead to partnerships, what lead to collaboration. The wild card here, of course, is Google Fiber. In a city that's learning how to change its view of economic development from building buildings to developing talent, Google's potential is enormous. And it's kept Mike Burke working overtime to make sure we take full advantage while we can. We have a window of time where we have a competitive advantage over the rest of the world. Kansas City is our first city. Congratulations. Just having high-speed fiber doesn't get you where you need to go. It's what we as a community can come together to make happen. Something like Launch KC. A new initiative from the city's EDC and the downtown council offering some real world tools to equip young businesses in the tech sector with things like reduced rents, access to Wi-Fi and mentoring, even a proof of concept center. Building the next Silicon Valley won't happen overnight, but with each success comes more momentum. We're very much a, a supportive community. Everyone knows how hard it is. To, to break through and, and have that big break. And when somebody else does, it's, it's kind of a win for the whole scene. This city is rocking right now. It's been just over a year since the company throwing this party, the software startup Rarewire, relocated from Prairie Village to the crossroads to plunge into the business of building mobile apps. This is a hundred billion dollar market that hardly existed three, four, five years ago. It's almost like the next big tech boom that happened in the 90s, it's happening again related to mobile. And we're knee deep in the middle of it. It was a leap of faith. We thought that even though there was some risk involved, it, it was the right time to do it. The right time, thanks to the arrival of the iPad back in 2009. Like, Matt Angel, who'd been teaching himself iOS, ended up inventing a new computer language called Wire. Then he and Kirk started targeting certain industries, like publishing, they felt might benefit from it. 
The pitch was going to be, send us a PDF file and we'll turn it into an app in 24 hours. And within, I think it was about 20 minutes, he got a call back from The Atlantic and they were basically saying, I don't believe that you can do what you're saying that you can do, but it sounds too good to be true, we'll take you up on it. It gave us a lot of instant credibility and we actually ended up winning a few awards for that. So that really jump-started our company. Like lots of local startups with little access to venture capital, Rarewire is self-funded with help from family and friends. Their goal is to add 40 jobs over the next five years, part of a state incentive program intended to stimulate the economy. But right now, they're most excited about their newest product, the App Creation Studio, a software platform built around Wire, an interface that lets a designer like Erica Berkman more quickly play programmer too. Yeah, Sounds like you're telling I'm me the poster good. child for it. <laughs> the creative boom taking place here has given new life to the old warehouses and factories that grew up around Union Station, a portal where thousands pass through every day. Today, these familiar faces are here to stay and to celebrate Site Tech, the first startup to accept Launch Casey's promise of affordable space. In this marble monument to the past, they say the future, of teleconferencing at least, awaits us upstairs. When people are starting to experience Sidek, they're just like, wow, this is amazing. We've never seen such a thing. So forget PowerPoint and problems with stage fright. Site Deck says their system can make a polished performer out of just about any teacher, sales manager, or CEO. It's a special camera which can observe infrared image so person standing on the front of the screen is not blind. The second element is a special engine, it's a hardware solution, and of course there's a screen. It's like a big iPad, six foot by 11 foot, and it's developed totally by iMat company. Do a nice double tap, we'll grow it up a little bit more. What you have to realize is the man on the screen is not in the room. That's Paul Vlahos. His LA-based company, IMAT, has made green screen technology an integral part of TV and film for decades. There are some shots which must be created by image compositing in post-production. What used to require a full-fledged TV studio can now be done from a conference room. Well, I want to welcome you to Kansas City. Can we have the... Paul may be talking from the coast. What am I pointing at? The Adobe Photoshop. Just check it. But we can still touch, point, play, even fist bump the same graphics and visual details in real time from up to four different locations. I come from a different kind of business than most people like at Cisco or at Tanberg. Our orientation is from building tools that are used by the entertainment industry. Putting out some Hollywood magic to make meetings more lively was the original plan for Site Deck. We're looking at the exact same file, so I can come over here. But already Paul's vision for it is beginning to broaden, thanks to discussions with Kansas City companies like HNTB. Constantly looking for new technologies to help us. Who see an incredible tool for architects and engineers. That kind of freewheeling give and take, which can ultimately make a product more commercially viable, should soon become even more common here at the station, thanks to the new Digital Sandbox Proof of Performance Center that UMKC's Block School is about to open. The festivities drew what could only be called an A-list crowd. And I can tell by the energy in this room that no one here needs to be sold on the importance of this unique, innovative project. A million dollar I-6 challenge grant got all this started part of the federal push to build an economy that will last. Though at this point it's largely symbolic, shifting the focus here from transportation to innovation sends serious signals that for Kansas City, tech is becoming more than just talk. My nightmare is waking up in three or four years and, and seeing Austin, Chicago, Denver are now Google cities and that Kansas City didn't take full advantage of what it had. What we've accomplished nationally in, in terms of taking advantage of it can be the template for the rest of the country. More than half a million children are currently trapped in the foster care system. Being removed from a home and placed in foster care is a difficult and a stressful experience for any child. 
Many of these children have suffered some form of serious abuse or neglect. The Midwest Foster Care and Adoption Association, which is based in Independence, is going to some extraordinary lengths, including hiring private investigators to try and locate family members who might be willing to adopt a hard-to-place child who might otherwise languish for years in the foster care system. They call their program Extreme Recruitment. And last year, they found homes for 22 foster children. And as you're about to see, including a home for 10-year-old Damage, whose mother abandoned him in Kansas City. First safe voice message. Yes, this is Eugene Baker on behalf of Damage. That is my nephew. Any type of ways to contact me, give me a call at this particular number. Any time after 4 o'clock, make contact with me. I've been a private investigator 22 years. I happen to specialize in background investigations on people, so I have a, a unique ability to find people that uh, are otherwise unfindable. This was a family that had been in California for years um, until Dimanche was about five and mom decided to, to come to Missouri. Um, and at that point she decided she couldn't care for him any longer. So she drove him to an area residential facility and dropped him off. Um, and unfortunately for Dimanche, um, he stayed in residential for several years because of his behaviors. Uh, I was able to ascertain that uh, the young boy had a, an uncle by the name of Eugene that lived in uh, California, a uh, very common last name. Uh, it took me probably a good couple of months to search through several hundred people with the same last name. Well, we had periodic telephone calls from his mother, and um, she never actually told us Demarge's location. It was John Acklin who contacted me, and he showed me a picture of Demarge, and I showed it to my daughter and the rest of my family. We knew right then and there, Damage need to come home. Uh, we felt he was lost. It's a very sad occasion when Damage departed from our lives. And we miss him. I know I do. And the most important thing is that he finally gets to be reconnected with his family. Um, after spending years away from his family, away from everybody that he knows, um, and being in a residential care facility, even though those are great facilities and there are some people who care very much about those kids that are there, it's not home. And so the best thing for Damage is that he finally gets to be reconnected with somebody that he lovingly calls Uncle Buzz. I'd rather just live with my real family because I have to move from foster care to foster care to foster care over and over again. And it's starting to get old. It was really sad because I didn't want to come from California away from my uncle. So yeah. I mean, he has always been my little man. And just to see Demarge, I think, just anticipate seeing him is exciting. Uh, it's a situation where he was lost and I found him and I found his family. And we're working to get him reunited again. They're gonna be pretty excited. I am. <laughs> There's the Mazier right there. I got him go. He's coming. All right. My little man. Yay! Come here, Demar J. Hey, who are you? My uncle? Here I am. Oh, you can't tell. Oh, look at the Maja. I knew you would be here. You know I would. I would let you down. It was great. I was very happy that I was able to make this connection. And I prayed and hoped that we could get these people together. And uh, it's happened. Extreme Recruitment is an intensive, um, focused effort to 
work diligently, quickly, efficiently to try to find uh, relatives or kin for children who are in foster care who have no options for permanency identified. You know, Jackson County has over 1,200 kids in foster care. Um, some of those kids are already placed with relatives. This program, Extreme Recruitment, is needed for those kids so that we can really dive into some of those family uh, geneograms and try to figure out who they are, where they came from, and can we get them connected back to where they belong. Everybody has to have a family. Everybody needs to know who their family is. And when somebody that has not had their family for many years or has never known them and then suddenly realizes they have a family out there that cares for them and loves them, the whole picture becomes something that is just phenomenal. It's, it's the greatest feeling in the world to do something like that. The Midwest Foster Care and Adoption Association says they hope to find homes for 40 children this year as part of their extreme recruitment program. You can learn more at the local show. Org. That segment was produced by Brian Shepard at Link, a KCPT partner organization which works to improve the lives of children and families in the Kansas City region. On the local show, we like to take you to places you've never been before or haven't been to in a while. Next up, we invite you to join us in the changing gallery at the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City's historic 18th and Vine neighborhood. Producer Sandy Woodson introduces us to local artist Ryan Harrelson, whose work is featured in Beyond Words, a fusion of poetry, visual art, and jazz. Well, the name of the piece is called The Briar Patch. And um, it's based on this uh, old southern folk tales, parables about a clever rabbit who's always succeeding in getting himself out of uh, tight situations with this, this fox and this bear that's always trying to get him to eat him. The reason that I uh, know of this story is because one of my favorite hip-hop artists, Devin the Dude, has has a song called The Briar Patch. So I'm li I was listening to this song, and he's pretty clever. He's a pretty clever artist, so like he's got this song, and it's like, please don't throw me in the briar patch. And like, and, and you listen to the words, and I, and I started researching like, briar patch, all right. Was, you know, and then I came across these cartoons. Because, I mean, in good contemporary art, I think there are references and like little holes like that, little things that you can like look and find more than just like, just a beat, you know, it'll lead you to something else. First met Ryan Harrelson at America Now and Here. And this was a, a national art project that was looking at uh, the identity of America in a post 9-11 context. And I met Ryan, he had some artwork as part of the exhibit that they had at the Lady Volkis Gallery. And I just thought his work was really exciting. And I was looking forward to an opportunity to work with him. And I knew that we had this space here. And my hope was that one day we would have his work in our changing gallery here at the American Jazz Museum. Beyond Words, a fusion of poetry, visual art, and jazz. The idea for this exhibit really came from uh, visual poetry. And visual poems are poems that are, the way that they're laid out, offer some additional uh, meaning, or it's done in some way that's really compelling. And so I thought it would be cool if we had an exhibit that had visual poems on display. And so I ran the idea by our visiting curator, Miss Sunny Ruffin, who thought it was really cool, but also thought it would be cool to incorporate the work of uh, visual artists who somehow employ text in their work. The name of this piece is Inside the Outside Box. I make things based on kind of where I'm at, and at the time I felt like, I guess, I was inside of a box that was outside of the norm. You know, like uh, not really escaping from being independent of anything, but I'm just in a different box. I like the fact that there are messages that he's communicating with his work. There's always something that he's exploring that I think is really worth talking about. When I was working on this piece along with the runaway slave figure here, those were slave quote patterns that I was looking at at the time. So um, 
There's all different types of um, patterns I would tell people they needed to hop a train or they needed to go in a path that wasn't direct. What caused that to be necessary in the first place? People lacking the ability to read and write, you know, people needing to covertly get a message across. So I thought that that was a cool way of uh, using pattern. The incredible level of detail and layers that are in his work. And no matter how many times I look at his paintings, I always discover something new. Yeah, there's a lot of different symbols in here. Um, and I guess that's, that's kind of what it is, in a way, my, my quilt. The exhibit Beyond Words runs through April 26th at the Changing Gallery at the American Jazz Museum at 18th and Vine. And finally this week, you didn't get to see them pick up their Grammys during the big primetime telecast over the weekend, but congratulations are in order for the Kansas City Chorale, who snagged two Grammys in Sunday's pre-show awards. The Chorale's 2012 album, Life and Breath, choral works by Renee Clausen, received Grammy Awards for Best Choral Performance and Best Engineered Classical Record. We leave you this week with the Chorale in words and music. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation. Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you.